Hey everybody, we are back. This is Jake Wynn uh, from the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. I'm here with my friend and colleague uh, Ryan Quint from the National Park Service. Uh, we are here, uh, moved about two to three miles uh, south of where our videos were previously in Saunders Field. Uh, so we are in the uh, in the woods along the Orange Plank Road. Uh, this is going to be a scene of a, a crucial incident uh, on May 6, 1864 regarding General James Longstreet. So we're going to talk a little bit about his wounding. Um, but we, in order to set that up, we need a little bit of context. So Ryan, can you tell us uh, where, where are we right now? Yeah, so we're towards the southern end of the battlefield um, near what is known as the Orange Plank Road, Brock Road intersection, which not to be dramatic or anything, but is one of the most important intersections in the United States on May 6, 1864. Whoever controls the intersection controls the ability to move south. If Robert E. Lee's Confederates can capture it, Ulysses S. Grant has no way out. If Grant can maintain that intersection, he can continue south towards Spotsylvania, getting out of the wilderness. Uh, Longstreet's Corps, James Longstreet commands the 1st Army Corps, Army of Virginia, has arrived on the battlefield earlier that morning uh, in the nick of time, right? The, U the U.S. 2nd Corps with elements of the U.S. 5th Corps have been breaking the Confederate right flank, and, and all seems lost for the Confederate Army when Longstreet's Corps arrives, repulses the U.S. forces, and then Longstreet himself is going to launch an attack of his own towards the intersection. So amidst that attack, uh James Longstreet is, is going to be, be wounded in a pretty famous incident that has some hallmarks of uh, events that took place a year earlier, uh, not too distant from here. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the circumstances that led to James Longstreet's wounding? Yeah, so the circumstances are everything is confused. Um, there are Confederates moving around everywhere. As part of James Longstreet's attack, he had detached a number of brigades of infantry just to our uh, rear in an unfinished railroad cut. The Confederates used that unfinished railroad cut to move unseen around the U.S. Army's flank and unleashed an attack. And so what you essentially have are Confederates moving this way, as well as Confederates led by Longstreet personally, down the plank road. And so as the two wings of the soldiers converge on each other, that's when you're going to have accidents happen. Uh, James Longstreet's men have just returned from Georgia, uh, and as they return, they get new uniforms. And some of the uniforms are dark, dark, dark gray material that under certain circumstances can look blue. And so as Longstreet's men converge on one another, um, there are Confederates on the far side of the road behind us, the Plank Road, uh, belonging to the Brigade of William Mahone, Virginians. And so as those Virginians return from repulsing U.S. pockets of resistance, they find Confederates on this side of the road. They see that dark kersey material, they think they're blue uniforms, and they open fire. And in that moment, James Longstreet rides into the crossfire. Now, you had alluded to an event a year earlier. That's, of course, the wounding of Stonewall Jackson at the Battle of Chancellorsville. And there are some differences. James uh, Longstreet, wrong place, wrong time. He, did, he was not the target of that volleys of musketry. He rides into the volley of fire. Jackson was the target of a mistaken volley of, of fire. And so wrong place, wrong time. Longstreet, his staff, and subordinate commanders ride into that crossfire. Uh, Micah Jenkins, a, a rising brigade commander of the Confederate Army, is shot through the head. He'll die. Uh, Longstreet is shot uh, in a number of different places. The, the most grievously is through the neck, uh, which lifts him out of the saddle and brings him back down. His right arm is paralyzed uh, for, for a time. Uh, he's left grievously wounded. Many fear him to be dead. Uh, not to get too far ahead of the story, but as he's being carted off the battlefield, a number of his soldiers remark, Longstreet's dead, Longstreet's dead. And Longstreet wrote later in his memoirs that using whatever energy he had left, he picked his hat off his head and the soldiers cheered him. Uh, but Longstreet's going to be out of the fight for a number of months. He won't return to the Army until October, November mm -hmm. of 1864, and his right arm will be paralyzed for years afterwards, um, only regaining limited mobility of that arm by the time he dies uh, in the 1900s. Yeah, so we'll get into kind of some more uh, elements of that in regards to Civil War medicine, specifically in the treatment of Longstreet. But before we get to that, I do want to uh, kind of talk about the landscape here. Uh, talk about the confusion that Ryan mentioned, you know, that, uh, that there is a lot of confusion in this battle. Um, and the landscape itself plays a part in this. And it's called the Battle of the Wilderness for a reason. Can you describe what this area would have looked like in May 1864. Yeah, so the trees we're seeing around us are in fact bigger than the trees that would have been here in 1864. The wilderness refers to a 70 square mile of, of, of area uh, stretching all the way back towards Chancellorsville in our area and then down towards Spotsylvania. 
the reason why the wilderness exists requires us to go back a little bit in history. Uh, in the 18th century, uh, settlers in the area found the, the, the ground, the landscape, very rich in iron deposits. And so they cut down trees and they clear cut forests to get at that iron deposit. And they set up a number of furnaces in the area. Well, those furnaces required even more wood to, to furnish the fires of those furnaces. And so they clear cut the areas even more. So from the 18th century to the middle of the 19th century, you have second and third generation regrowth, stunted thickets and woods and bushes and briars that don't have a chance to, to grow up, to mature into nice tall trees. And instead you have this scraggly underbrush visibility in any one direction maybe 25 yards and then you throw a bunch of soldiers shooting at each other there's smoke and there's yelling and and, and everything uh, and so they can't see anything uh, and, and it makes for an interesting battle to study because no one agrees on anything uh, how can you say this unit moved so many yards in this direction we don't know they find they lose themselves in the wilderness if you look around and there's no landmark you don't know where you are it's not like Gettysburg where you can say okay we were so close to the Kadori farm or we were so close to the Trosel house. That doesn't happen here. There's nothing. There's woods that way. There's woods that way. There are no landscapes. And so the wilderness is a, a, a terrifying place to fight. And the armies fight here twice mm -hmm. uh, in Chancellorsville and wilderness. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I was, as I was going back through my old notes uh, for, for the, uh, the tours that I used to give here uh, in 2015 when I worked briefly here as an intern, um, came across a, a quote that I used in my original tour notes, uh, which says that this place was the shadow of death, um, which is a pretty good uh, description of, of what those soldiers, what uh, U.S. soldiers and Confederate soldiers thought about fighting in here, especially those who had experience doing so before. And all of this dense underbrush that, that Ryan mentioned, this kind of, uh, these thickets, uh, are particularly dry in the spring of 1864. Not a lot of rain. Uh, it makes this area just a, a tinderbox, quite literally, um, that fires are going to break out, uh, and that is going to, to uh, as has already been mentioned, and we can go into this in more detail a little bit later, wounded soldiers on the ground, it, as these uh, thickets are burning, are, are going to be, in some cases, uh, roasted alive uh, in between these, these fighting lines. Uh, but that's getting a little bit off our topic here. Uh, pull back to, to James Longstreet here. And I wanted to do a little bit more specific on, on Longstreet's uh, wounds. Uh, there is a fantastic article from the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association from 2000 uh, that was written by uh, Dr. Robert Streckler and Dr. John Blakely, um, which I highly recommend to all of you to go read. Um, but pulling that up, um, it's a discussion about the wounds and treatment of James Longstreet. And as Ryan mentioned, uh, caught in the crossfire, uh, he is gonna be struck uh, numerous times, but the, the most dangerous wound is going to be one uh, that is uh, to his shoulder and his neck. Um, and this is going to be uh, a, a, a source of debate when it comes to Longstreet's wounding as to which was the entry wound, which was the exit wound. And this is something that uh, in this 2000 uh, medical uh, journal uh, paper, these doctors go into in some depth. And they contend uh, that the bullet actually came in uh, behind, uh, from behind uh, Longstreet's uh, right shoulder, uh, passing upwards uh, and coming out through his neck. And you can imagine how dangerous of a wound this would be. And it's understandable um, why those who see the wounding happen and see Longstreet afterwards think he's dead. I mean, this is a wound that for many soldiers during the Civil War had been a fatal wound. That they would bleed out from that wound, especially in the neck is a very dangerous spot to be, to be wounded. Uh, and so Longstreet is going to almost immediately uh, go into shock as a result of this wound. And you can see this from the accounts that are written. Uh, there are uh, numerous accounts of those once Longstreet is removed from the battlefield itself and being stretchered away, then put onto an ambulance and taken back to the First Corps uh, Hospital uh, at Parker's store, that they are going to, uh, soldiers are looking at at Longstreet and other officers, and they comment on how pale he was, um, and that he had clearly lost a lot of blood. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, just kind of an effort to lift his cap was uh, incredibly difficult for him to do, uh, that there is a lot of weakness from blood loss and also from shock that he is experiencing. Related to the neck wound uh, is also, uh, we see from the accounts of the time, that as he is kind of struggling to breathe, 
after this wound that as he's breathing there is almost a, there's a bloody foam coming out of his mouth uh, and that is suggestive of damage to his trachea uh, damage to his airway done by this bullet rocketing through his body uh, and this is going to be a uh, in particular, uh, a very, very dangerous wound to deal with. Uh, but when Longstreet is evacuated, uh, he is going to arrive at that at that uh, first core hospital. Uh, and he's going to be seen by a kind of a, a elite group of uh, surgeons in the Army of Northern Virginia, including the Army's chief surgeon and the medical director of the Army of Northern Virginia, Lafayette Guild, is among the surgeons who will treat uh, Longstreet. And they are going to very quickly deem, by looking at the wounds, that it is, and this is a quote, not necessarily fatal, um, uh, not necessarily a, a mortal wound that will be, uh, that will be uh, seen here with Longstreet. Uh, they are able to patch him up, and that includes uh, going into that wound. Because there is an entrance and an exit wound, there is no bullet in his body. That would be the first step that they're going to try to pull that out uh, of him. Um, they're going to kind of close up the wounds. They're going to uh, bandage it tightly. Uh, if they're uh, try to suture, close some of the uh, vessels, the blood vessels that have been ruptured uh, by this by this wounding, and then they're going to put him onto an ambulance. And ultimately, James Longstreet's wounding and his evacuation is is. Uh, very similar to that of many other Confederate soldiers. And it's important we can follow the route of the Confederate battlefield evacuation plan uh, from here on the Wilderness Battlefield, uh, back through Orange, uh, ultimately on to Charlottesville, Lynchburg, and then many of the wounded will end up at hospitals in, in those communities, as well as in Richmond. Uh, as for Longstreet himself, he is going to be cared for in Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, until that town is threatened later on in 1864 and they move uh, uh, they move Longstreet away down to Georgia where he's going to uh, to recuperate slowly from his wounds and as uh, Ryan uh, discussed earlier in the video uh, come back to the army uh, in the fall of 1864 uh, though still quite debilitated by his wounds and that will be a situation for years to come Longstreet is going to be suffering from the aftermath of, of his experience here being caught in the crossfire and the fighting at the wilderness uh, again a fascinating uh, element to look specifically at one wounding um, to say how medical care uh, took place during the Civil War and how uh, the evacuation of Confederate soldiers worked here at uh, the Wilderness. Um, that is uh, going to be where we're going to leave it here. I want to thank you, Ryan, for, for giving some, some great context there for us, uh, describing where we are and, and what happened here with, with Longstreet. Uh, and thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, if you did enjoy the video today, click that like button, subscribe to our channel, and consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. You'll help to promote uh, and, and share stories like this through your support. So thank you all so much for tuning in.